Hey guys, it's Chad Larson with MLD Wealth. This is April's edition of Money Matters. A um, couple days into the month here, as always, scrambling to, I think, take stock of, of kind of where we're at. We just ended Q1 and wanted to give you guys some of the best insights as we can. What an incredible start to the year. Um, much deserved after two very challenging years in the market. Reviewing a lot of and trying to condense almost two years worth of doing this uh, on video, on podcast, and in print uh, over the last number of years. And I've, I've tired myself of saying the same thing over and over again. We've used the word COVID. We've used the word Russia, Ukraine. We've talked U.S. politics, yada, yada, yada. We've talked the Magnificent Seven and the te technological boom and advances of AI. You know, what is going on in the world Um and I think more so constructively over the last couple of months, we've been setting the tone for why uh, we've become quite bullish, uh, why we've been deploying aggressively and, and actively into the markets and, and understandingly why. So instead of pointing out why we didn't do something or why we're going to do something, I want to talk about kind of the advancements of a, of a thesis and a theory and how they evolve and how the investment cycle uh, works. I've used this colloquialism a few times over the last podcast and many times in conversations with clients. Portfolios are not light switches. Uh, they are faucets. They are taps. We're, you know, we're turning dials. We're adding things. We're taking things away. We're choking some things off. We're drying parts of the portfolio out. We're putting out fires. Um, we're tilting cash. We're over exposing ourselves to certain segments of the market and trying to position capital as, uh, as best possible to meet the needs of our clients and capture parts of the economic growth engine. A few things I want to discuss today, and it really tells the tape. And I think I, I will see if this, if I recorded this properly. Most of you see this on the podcast, but if you want to see the video version, it's available on YouTube as well. Um, we were setting the tone for, you know, first off, you know, no one made 33% last year, but that was the inevitable return of the S&P 500 last year. And I've discussed this at nauseum in the past, largely driven from what the market was calling the magnificent seven, these seven tech leadership companies uh, benefiting from the AI tailwinds and, you know, re-expansion trade from the Fed starting to slow it, you know, stopping the interest rate hiking cycle, really setting the fuse for the next bull market. Um, you know, we've been talking about, the market has been talking about uh, being on the front end of recession for two years. And more and more, it looks like that's not happening. Now, we would say economic news would be, um, negative over the next couple of bits we are seeing joblessness numbers high um you know commodity prices and you know cost of housing and gasoline etc remain elevated um bets that the fed will i think we started the year um, the market was pricing in about six interest rate cuts that's been tempered back a little bit but the enthusiasm for u.s equities um and equities in general to a lesser degree canada which i'll get into um remains a constructive thesis where we're very we have high conviction of why we made that high conviction call in december to you know accelerate our exposure into the u.s equity complex a couple reasons let's just for benefit of doubt say that these seven companies that make up 1.6 percent of the stocks in the s p 500 but account for 30 percent of the market cap uh, of the s p 500 you know really being the the tail is definitely wagging the dog but let's just assume fine uh the market returned 33 percent last year in the s p regardless if it was leadership from seven companies there's the magnificent seven and the, the not so magnificent 493 companies if you can see this chart up here, this is exactly um, the two-year chart. 2022 represented the worst market for a balanced investor, you know, since the Great Depression. You know, the the S and P 500 was down 19 plus percent. Bonds got smoked. Uh, the average balance fund in the U.S. was down 18.9 or 19.2 percent. Don't quote me, but conjecturally, you, you understand where I'm going. So when the market goes, you have 100 bucks and it's turned into 80. Um, and the next year that 80 makes 33%, you can see after losing and the market's making their bottom in October, um, calling that market bottom as we like market march forward. And again, assumptively assuming you're just staying in the S and P two years later, you were just basically flat. And in those two years, we've seen earnings per share grow by 10% per annum, but yet the market is flat. Um, so that's going to tell you that, and it's told us and it's signaled to us that, you know, aside from, oh, I can't invest in the market, it's already up 33%. 
was down 20 the year before. The markets are really just get back to go. So what is the impetus and what are the catalysts driven forward that could send the markets higher? So this is 22, 23. Market's basically flat, yet we've seen earnings growth uh, increase consecutively through that. Economists got it all wrong. Forecasters got it wrong. They said no growth, no GDP growth, and we saw it. 2023, Magnificent Seven led the way, you know, steaming the market forward. Great. We know that. Um, what does that mean? And this is that call that we made kind of early into the year. After two years of net dismal returns, um, taking out the Magnificent Seven, um, nine out of 11 gig sectors were negative. Um, two years, when the market's down two years in a row, the book says buy. Um, and there's a number of reasons why. we, The Fed signaled a pause and the end of an interest rate hiking cycle. Anytime the Fed is, you know, when they cut, TBD, but it's sooner than, than never. Um, and it's also, and longer pauses actually bode well historically for accelerating equity returns because it really uh, solidifies um, the belief that inflation is kept into check. So we made that call to overweight US equities. Uh, models were tilted and adjusted um, with no bias, just market cap weighting, really dominant in the tech space and, and maintained our exposure to energy. Energy really led the way, shockingly, for the quarter, um, up 19%. The S&P returned 9.9% in the first quarter. Um, Interestingly, I've got a little bit of a stars here, uh, kind of in, I think it was April 20th, after just an hour, uh, March 20th, pardon me, um, January, February, March, yeah, March 20th, um, Mehul and I kind of took stock of the run that we've made in our U.S. equities and understanding that, you know, the Dow, the Russell 2000, you know, like the more value tilted parts of the market because they're not market cap weighted um, or really not seeing any love. And it was, again, being really driven by these technology companies, made the decision tactically to reduce our exposure to the S&P 500 and transition that exposure to more of an equal weight. We took all the buckets and took, took all the money and spread it equally across sectors de facto kind of taking a bit of a value tilt um, to the market and saying the market's had a hell of a run. Uh, we're very happy with year to date performance. We're not becoming defensive, um, nor are we calling that the market's not going to be choppy into the end of the year. And I'll get to that a little bit. Just remember, guys, it is normal that almost every year there's a peak to trough of 10 percent. Can we see a 10% correction? Sure, you can always see that. It's a normal course of business. Now, listen, I understand Ed, there's the most uncomfortable time for a portfolio manager or an investment advisory team is the first time you take someone's capital. It's the first time you lend me your car. The last thing I need to do is borrow it for a week and bring it back with scratches. If I've driven the car for 20 years with no incidences and we get a door ding, well, it's just a part of the driving experience and these things happen. But, you know, that challenge and that question comes to us all the time. You know, we've seen incredible growth in our practice and the, our existing clients, um, you know, have been absolutely stellar and we continue to develop and grow within these existing relationships. And we see a lot of strong fund flow because, you know, cash weightings have been at a historical high, uh, which, again, I'll get to. We, when do you deploy? You know, with the benefit of hindsight, it's crystal clear. Um you know, it's it's always tough to say the client that, you know, took the recommendation and became a client in December, um, you know, thinks we're gods. Um, you know, the client that gave money two years ago is kind of wondering when they're going to start making money. And that's normal. The further you step back from the chart, you understand that the, the equity indexes are the best places to uh, grow your, your capital over the long term. But in the short term, volatility is a normal course of business. Um, Kind of one of the things that I want to talk about is catalysts kind of moving forward is, you know, what do we expect into the end of the year? There's a lot of positive things. And I remember, um, and many of you remember, uh, a number of years ago, we made like a ta big tactical call into the U.S. multifamily real estate complex. Um, and it was, a, you know, a fateful meeting uh, with a gentleman based out of Toronto who's, you know, become a great friend of ours and a great capital partner, uh, runs a large real estate platform. You know, he came into to my office, uh, into our, our firm's office, and I snuck into the back of the room you know, needing a free sandwich. And, and you know, in four points, uh, he made it very clear as to why there was a structural 
reason and opportunity set in U.S. multifamily. At that time, we had near U.S. dollar parity. Um, he was going to be investing in Sunbelt states, which we're seeing higher than average uh, you know, job growth opportunities, large tech campuses removing. Um, we had the ability to have cap rate compression due to larger portfolios being aggregated that would become institutionally viable for, for monetization and operatorship. They were have shown a history of incredible uh, NOI growth through prudent and disciplined and uh, management of those assets. So I kind of walked out of that meeting, four green check marks, no real X's, manager was putting big uh, money in of his own uh, alongside his family and we made that bet so as you, you know you look for more more buy signals than sell signals you know if it's 50 50 generally avoid it but there was you know everything was pointing in one direction and with high conviction we made that allocation and ended up making our clients uh, you know a lot of money um when i look at the markets right now we're going into election cycle markets, you know, historically uh, well post election cycle, we see the opportunity for a synchronized global economic recovery and through 2025, Europe will figure it out, things will start to calm down geopolitically, China will reestablish its footing and start growing again. Um, we have kind of a historic kind of valuation gap between um, the broader market that continues to see robust earnings growth. Um, we have an accommodating Fed with an easing monetary supply with interest rates about to come down and cash on the sidelines is absolutely ludicrous. You know, estimates of interest income generated by mark money market funds is over $300 billion. You know, we've never seen a this much cash in money market and B interest rates where they're at. So knowing that yields are coming down, um, we're actually like really recommending uh, clients that are holding large you know, deposits and GICs, et cetera, to duration should become your friend right now. If you are wanting to maintain that ultra, ultra conservative approach, um, you should be looking at adding duration because that short end of the curve is going to come down and interest rates are going to come down. I don't think overnight, but it's about as good as it's going to get for a while. So when you look at money market funds and total financial assets, you were talking about between CDs, you know, commercial deposits and money market funds uh, approaching nine trillion dollars. That is at levels that we have not seen ever. You know, obviously the supply of money has only increased, but from a percentage weighting to overall financial assets, when that money starts flowing back into the market, into that recovery, just remember most people are late to the party. Um, they need to know that the party is really awesome and it's been going great before they want to show up. That is going to bode well and it provides incredible secular tailwinds to a bull market. You know, t on a technical basis, the market made its bottom last October or 14 months into this recovery, obviously only led by a few handful of tech stocks. Um, so we're very positive in, in that fashion. You know, talking, I'm not going to spend a whole bunch of time talking about this soft landing and post fed pivot um caution looming with respect to you know like the taglines are there um but the reality is this you know the simplest you can you can make it is we've been talking about that seventh eighth inning of of that recovery of that bad market we're through that um that leadership will show you that a strong january february sets a very positive tone into the end of the year um we talked about interest rates. The U.S. presidential election is approaching. Uh, a lot of speculation around how markets perform, depending on which party, Republican or Democrat. Listen, it's like fractionally different, and it's pretty hard to put a pin uh, in that because most as a as parties change, you know who is accountable. Is there a lag effect to other economic policies that were put into place? That being said. Um, you know, there's a bevy of election issues um, for the markets to focus on. It's going to be inflation, tax policy, federal spending, immigration, um, U.S.-China rivalry, um, deglobalization. Like there's just all of these talk points. And, you know, th this could turn into 60 minutes of geopolitical rhetoric and economic theory. Um, we just really want to hammer home like Wall Street and Main Street don't always intersect. Um you know, for Wall Street, very few Main Street items result in being large and sustained drivers of stock market and sector returns. That divisiveness and lack of unity in the U.S. is really, I think, more than anything, the biggest fear that we see is another reality TV series drama of 
an election cycle that or an election that won't be called the night of the election. I think it's teeing up, you know, right now, if the election was to happen today, um, polls would lead to a Republican uh, win. There's a lot of negative things, you know, in front of the incumbent um, to get through. Got it wrong on immigration, got it wrong on economic policy, got it wrong on foreign relationships, et cetera, et cetera. And age becomes a massive issue. Um, but the other side um, really has done nothing more than point out the obvious and really has an established, you know, constructive platform for the market to rally on. So yes, it is very normal. And we do expect volatility to increase uh, into, um, you know, that end of the year. Um, and that's a normal course um, uh, of the business. I'm just moving off camera here. Um, that's okay. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about, you know, we, we talked about our exposure to energy, um, you know, and it kind of hurt us, um, you know, last year was kind of took a bit of a pause. It was an incredible driver of returns in 2022, um, really loving the equity valuations and the balance sheet strength and the free cash flow profile of these businesses. But at the same time, um, maybe being a little bit more tepid on the outlook for commodity, uh, any amount of recovery in global growth, um, is very positive. We're long-term structurally bullish. No one's uh, getting around on dreams and hopes yet of, uh, you know, of, of liberal fantasies. Um, sorry to put my politics into the room. Um, but energy did the really heavy lifting, you know, it's, uh, you know, March has already been a solid month in the S and P an even better one for oil and gas, you know, as the month drew a close, Energy was the top performing sector, the S&P 500 Energy Select, and that's companies like Exxon, Chevron, Conoco, which all um, have meaningful weights across portfolios. They gained more than 12, uh, more than 12 percent compared to the benchmarks index rise of three. Um, you know, that outsized rise came as oil futures climbed more than 15 percent. So oil's up, gold's up, Bitcoin's up. Um, Value hasn't caught its uh, its day, but you know we we remain convicted to our long term thematics. Even I've been discussing uh, the exposure to copper. Um, probably it's not a tomorrow trade, and it wasn't a yesterday trade, but it really broke out uh, over the last month, showing a breadth uh, uh, of life uh, in through what's going on when global growth uh, returns into the marketplace um, that tight supply and long lead time to bringing on new uh, new mines etc is going to create a very tight market and that's starting to show up no one rings the bell at the start of a bull market and we want to be very cautious in, in in how we approach that the you know i don't want to belabor um things for the sake of um eating up your time um like i said 10% swings are normal. We had a heck of a run thus far into the year. We're very happy the way we've positioned. We've brought down some of our exposure to, to technology, taken a more measured and valued approach. Uh, we do expect uh, election to uh, the election to cause a spike in volatility, likely September through November. So prepare for some bumps. But again, portfolios are not light switches. We'll adjust the dials. You know, we we have our safety straps in. Our exposure um, outside of the equity markets through the inclusion of alternatives, private credit, um, hedge funds, equities, etc., have made for not only the inclusion of additional alpha sources, but also for the smoothing out of that experience um, across the board. So in an area we're spending some time on, we have initiated a small position in U.S. small and mid cap uh, across model portfolios. Uh, when you have scenarios where the value orientated part of the market, like the Dow and the Russell 2000, which is more of the growth index, um, being near flat and down over two years, it will tell you as that bucket starts to reevaluate as cash comes in, it's not all going into NVIDIA and Facebook. Um, it is going to spill down and trickle through the market. You will see a constructive. You've even started to see a few IPOs happening. Capital markets are thawing out uh, at a rapid race. And, you know, the market does price in the future uh, of the world. And when we see a synchronized global recovery through 2025 and strong GDP growth, you've got to be a part of that. Um, like always, guys, I ex really appreciate the chance to be able to um, to work for you, um, to give you advice and help you navigate um, very challenging and confusing capital markets. Myself and my entire team um, are here at your disposal. Feel free to contact us with any questions or comments you might have, or even topics you want us to address. 
offline. I've alluded to the fact that we will be, you know, coming into the marketplace with a kind of a first of its kind um, platform and opportunity set, um, you know, into the private uh, credit markets, et cetera. Um, and that I, you know, I teased, I would bring in uh, some kind of key speakers just to kind of table set and, and tonally set why we think this will be structurally uh, the tailwinds for this, uh, this sub-segment of the market is going to um, continue to blow in our favor for the foreseeable time. Have a wonderful month, guys. Um, weather's doing better for everyone. No matter where you are in the world, flowers are starting to come out. So take the time, uh, enjoy it, be healthy, be safe. And I look forward to uh, speaking with many of you, seeing you. And uh, as always, feel free to reach out with any comments and questions you might have. Have a wonderful day, guys. 